my name is Joe McLean. I host a radio program called A Catholic Take, where we look at the world through a Catholic lens. I'd love for you to hang out with us. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. Xavier Reyes Echal is our guest. He wrote a book on revelations, and it's a huge, huge book. The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But uh, there's a chapter in there that is utterly fascinating. Lost Let's Secret on the Future King of France. It says, uh, it is Lucifer who governs France. God will give us a hidden king whom no one will think of, and he will give him to us after the scourges. Oof, this is very, very fra uh, fascinating. And he joins us this morning. Good morning to you, Xavier. Good morning. How are you? Praise be to God. I am alive, and that counts. How are you? <laughs> very well, thank you. Very nice to meet you and speak with you. Uh, you know, this subject of this prophesied uh, French monarch has come up Several times on my program, we have some really incredible people who are part of our audience. Uh, Kilroy Jones is really excited right now that you're on the show. He recommended you, among others, and uh, and I was happy that you said yes to being on. So the French monarch, let's start with who, where did this prophecy come from? It's linked to La Salette and a secret portion of La Salette that is only now being revealed. Give us the backstory, please. Of course, um, it all began first and foremost uh, with the apparition of La Salette, uh, which took place on September the 19th, 1846. A secret, by the way, which I have to tell, although the apparition site had been formally approved by the local Archbishop of Grenoble and later by the Dicasterium of the Doctrine of the Faith in the Vatican, which translates today into a modern congregation of the faith, uh, it's been hidden purposely by the Archbishop of Grenoble because the message in itself was um, theologically and politically quite inconvenient. So, um, indeed, um, in La Salette, it began with La Salette, and then it was followed up later, a few years later, by another uh, stigmatist, visionary, remarkable one, named Marie-Julie Janney, in Brittany, in the same country of France. And so this particular message is quite extraordinary, particularly uh, when it was given first in La Salette. The Virgin Mary, when she appeared to Melanie Calva and Maximin Giraud, indeed announced that there would be a restoration, a king who would come in France um, after events which will put France on its knees and out of breath. And this king to come according to the Blessed Virgin Mary, would be a descendant, a direct descendant from the king and the queen martyrs of France, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Wow. In this wow. instance, uh, remarkably enough, um, Maxima Giraud uh, received a particular mission uh, for a few years later to meet the Count of Chambord, who was in Austria at the time in the Chateau de Falstaff. No? Now, you have to understand the context of the time. In uh, 1870, we had the Franco-Prussian War, which France lost, I'm afraid, miserably to the Prussians, no? leading to the loss of the regions of uh, Alsace and Lorraine. After the defeat of the Franco-Prussian War, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, Napoleon III, nephew of the actual Napoleon I, was made capture, first of all, during the war. And after the um, cessation of hostilities and um, the, the armistice signed the capitulation, uh, Alsace-Lorraine was given to the new G uh, German Empire. Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon III, was ever so embarrassed that he never returned to France and went to London in exile. So here we are. The Fr Third French Empire disappeared. There were new elections, the Republic came again, but remarkably enough, all the deputies that were elected were royalists, were in favor of the return of the monarchy. And the pretender to the crown at the time was the Count of Chambord in Austria. So they went to see him and offered him the crown again for the restoration of the, of the, um, the kingdom again of France. The Count of Chambord was an extraordinary man, a very practicing man, extraordinary and remarkable man. All of a sudden, he received the uh, visit of Maxima Giraud, 
who had received four instructions from the Blessed Virgin Mary in La Salette to meet him and reveal to him a secret. The secret was this. He met with him, indeed, and during the meeting, there was uh, the best friend of the Comte de Chambord, who was uh, the Count Henri de Vancey, who acted as his secretary and reported everything, him extraordinarily enough. When the little Maxima Giraud met with the Count of Chambord, he told him that the Blessed Virgin Mary told him to tell him that his cousin, Louis XVII, son of Louis XVI and of Marie Antoinette, had indeed survived, unlike what the Republicans in France stated. You have to understand that while Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were being processed and judged and finally murdered, not executed, blooming murdered, the little son, the Dauphin, the Prince of France, Louis XVII, who was merely 10 years old, was placed in a cell in a, in a jail called Le Temple, the Temple. Now, and hardly could they ever execute a little 10-year-old boy. So what they did, they did an infamy. They placed him in a cell, waiting for him to die. Oh, wow. Now, indeed, oh, wow. they found a corpse of a child. The corpse of the, the, of the child that they found after autopsy showed the corpse of a 14-year-old boy, a teenager, not that of a 10-year-old boy. And, and so, and I'm still talking to you as a Frenchman, since 1789 till today, a debate has been going on, blades have been crossed forever in endless debates as to whether or not the Prince of France, the Dauphin, was indeed saved and survived. Now, to go back to um, the revelation, the secret given to the Count of Chambord, Maximin Giraud told the Count that indeed the young man survived and that his descendants one day will be called to sit upon the throne again at a time of utmost need. The Count of Chambord, according to the testimony of the Count of Vincey, who witnessed the entire meeting, said, after he gave him a roll of gold coins just for him to be able to return to La Salette, said, my God, this is incredible. And just at this moment when I was being offered the crown of France, what am I to do? This is extraordinary revelation. But it was to be kept a secret. That was the recommendation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So finally, after walking in the garden of the Chateau de Falstaff, uh, the Count de Chambord turned towards his friend and told him, look, Henri, we've been given a secret which only God will reveal in his good time. But in all conscience, I cannot accept the crown of France for this particular reason. So his friend told him, but Henri, what are you going to do? You cannot tell them, since this is a secret, the reason of your refusing the crown. You have to tell them something. So the Count of Chambord came up with an excuse, which sounds idiotic, but was a good one nonetheless. He said, well, I'm going to ask if they want me to take the crown and to take the th seat on the throne to restore the old flag of France of my uh, uncle Louis XIV, which was a white flag with golden fleur-de-lis and a sacred heart in the middle. He knew they would never accept. And he was right. The deputies came to ask him and uh, asked for his formal response. And he told him, therefore, his conditions, which were naturally unacceptable. If this was presented to the French people, there would be another revolution yet again. The deputies came back to Paris and wrote to the French newspaper stating, the Prince of France, Henri de Chambord, refused the crown for a simple handkerchief. <laughs> no one wow. knew that, in fact, the secret was the reason why the Comte de Chambord could not, in all conscience, accept a crown which was meant for the descendant of his cousin. <laughs> so you're saying that Louis the Seventeenth, the son of Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth, he survived, and this prophesied French monarch is a direct relation to Louis the Seventeenth. So it's a bloodline relation back to. Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette. Yes, and this has been revealed by the Blessed Virgin Mary in an apparition site, which has formally been approved by the local bishop and by the Dicasterium of the Doctrine of the Faith in the Vatican. Why would they? Why would this part of La Salette be hidden from the from the faithful? Because, as you can imagine, in a country like France which has been a republic now for quite a while, for almost two centuries, the idea of seeing 
the descendant of a king which has been martyred by the Republicans is not particularly to the taste of the socio-communists or of the Freemasons which today are occupying the Élysée and the French government. Quote, I have never announced the return of the Orléans family, and I would think it a chastisement of God upon France if they sat on the throne. Going on to say the Holy Pope with the most Christian king will make one in the faith. The grand triumph of the church will be seen under the angelic pastor and the terrestrial angel who will be of the descendants of the martyr King Louis the Sixteenth. close quote. Wow. Xavier, welcome back to the show. I really appreciate having you on the team today. So let's talk about who is the direct descendant of Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette, which, by the way, can I just have you back some other time? to clear up myths and misconceptions about Louis the 16th and Marie Antoinette. I think that would also be very fascinating to do, but we don't have time for that today. So, who is the descent is there a descendant today alive and who is this person and where do they live? Yes. Well, uh quite so. This man is alive. This man is an extraordinary man. This man is the hope of France. The hope of the Christian community in the world as we were told through uh, the revelations to Maxime Giraud and also through uh, Marie-Julie Jeanne, that this man will put back France on his feet, will restore an angelic pope in Rome, and will restore a Catholic communities of yesteryears in a world which will be out of breath and recovering from a major disaster. But yes, the source um, of the family of the future king of France. It must be said, you mentioned the family, first of all, you must um, underline the fact that the Dorléans branch of the royal family Bourbon is indeed uh, the one that is castigated or pushed aside by heaven, according to the revelations given to Mélanie Calva and Maxime Giraud. Why? Because the branch of the, Do the Dorléans branch in France uh, during the time of the judgment of Louis XVI, there was a vote that led to whether or not he would be executed through la guillotine, through a decapitation. The, 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 it was half and half. Half of the newly um, chosen deputies were in favor to let him be and let him survive and his family. The vote while, went in favor of decapitating Louis XVI, who in his um, uh, will uh, stated that he forgave his persecutors and the people of France and Marie Antoinette. Wow. So the one vote that chose, that led to the execution of Louis XVI was, was by his cousin, Philippe called Philippe d'Egalité, who was a nobleman from the Bourbon family and who voted against his own cousin and for his execution. Mm. This family ever since has defended the choice, the choice of their ancestor, Philippe d'Egalité. And today, the so-called pretender to the French crown, uh, the son of the Count of Paris, is nothing less than, than a Freemason who has created his own Freemasonic lodge in Paris called the Fleur de Lys, which is oh, a wow. scandal. Therefore, all French Catholics good Catholics and royalists, defenders of the faith, defenders of the crown, the real crown, as stated by the Blessed Virgin Mary to the children of La Salette, must wait for the arrival of the descendant of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, who will make an appearance once he is called by a privileged soul from France, who will be called to go and see him in a place where he is. No one knows, but he will be called to come to France and claim his rightful right to the throne. Now, there is more. Through the apparition of Marie-Julie Jeanne, stigmatist, informally approved by her local bishop, uh, uh, Monsignor Fournier, in June, on June the 6th, 1876, uh, Marie-Julie Jeanne stated that the future king uh, was called by the Blessed Virgin Mary, Henry the Fifth of the Cross and that he, we are not supposed to look for him, for if we were to find him at this present time, his enemies, particularly Freemasons, his pretenders and 
uh, arch Republicans would seek for him and attend to his life. We are asked to be obedient and to wait for his coming. He will show proof that he is indeed the unquestionable descendant of Louis XVI and of Marie Antoinette. His name again, Henry V of the Cross. Okay, so uh, are we talking about right now or is he yet to be born and i mean is it going to be the descendant of the descendant that lives now i mean so give me a sense of the timing of this when can we expect him to ascend to the throne of france within the next decade two decades a century what are we talking about the only source of uh, point of reference we have time wise are two one given by maxime Giraud, who clearly stated that these events were supposed to take place either, depending on, first of all, depending on the way the faithful would, re would respond through prayer, through conversion, conversion through principally confession and the receiving of the Holy Eucharist, you know, and living and reading the Holy Scriptures, particularly the Gospels. So according to the way the faithful respond, it could have happened as early as the end of the 20th century or as late as the first quarter of the 21st century. According to Marie Gilligeny, the arrival of the French king will come after that France will be uh, subverted by a hordes of foreigners, particularly <laughs> Muslim foreigners, who will be coming from Northern Africa and the Middle East, who would start to put Paris in fire through protest, destruction, and so on and so forth, immediately follow through a sort of uh, upheaval, a revolution of sorts, immediately followed thereafter by the invasion of Western Europe by Eastern European forces and Muslim forces who would disembark through an alliance with Russians through southern Italy, southern France, and Andalusia and La Costa del Sol in Spain. At that time, the French king will be called by a French um, nobleman from France, whom, uh, who, in accordance to the prophecies, will be a superior officer of France retired. He will be revealed through an apparition where the king is and will be instructed to go meet him and ask him to start the mission that God has entrusted him to achieve. Wow. So that's like right now. I mean, France is, oui. I've been reporting um, a, a number of times on the situation in France. And I had a guest on earlier this week from the European conservative talking about France. And I asked the same question to her. France has never recovered from the French revolution. It's still going on there in that country. Will the French people follow a French monarch once again? If there will have to be, a, I'm talking now as a Frenchman, there will have to be an abscess and that must be put out. A tremendous tragedy will have to come through to finally show the Frenchman that this politics that has been undertaken, principally starting with François Mitterrand, followed by François Hollande, and now pursued stupidly by Emmanuel Macron, uh, by receiving millions and millions of Muslims who do not want to... Um, convert or assimilate themselves to the rules, the traditions of the French country, of the French nation, of the French traditions, but wants to convert and assimilate France to theirs. No? Once, finally, this war takes place and this hardship comes through, the French people will realize and will call for the French king to take his proper place. I mean, there's... So much to go down here and to think about. And and um, and looking at in your book, I have not read your whole book. I've just been reading parts of it uh, through my script account. I still want to get a, a hard copy of it. It's just so huge. I'll, I'll say this, though. there you're, you're covering the wide, massive range of Marian prophecies. How long did it take you to put all that together? It was uh, quite an endeavor. It took me about practically three years to, to gather all this information. And since I've been working with Father René Laurentin in France for a few years, in the 90s, I had a lot of contacts in France uh, who were able to guide me through and refer me to different uh, personalities. And there was a research and a work that I absolutely adored. And I only, there was only one thing that I regretted was, was when I finally dotted the very last line. I would have loved to continue. But after 569 pages, I thought it was time. <laughs> it was, at some point, you do have to cut it off, right? <laughs> at some point. Yes. Uh, uh, you, you, there's a, 
a further chapter down the way in your book. I, I'm looking at it through script, so my pages won't match the actual hard book. But it says, France is guilty. She will be punished and punished. It takes blood to repair the outrages with which my heart is showered. France uh, is making a huge wound to my heart. She does not content herself. She enlarges it every day. Pray, my children, come near my tabernacle. I bring that up to point out that you talk about the French king, the French monarch, in connection to uh, like big things like volcanoes blowing up in the UK and war and chastisements. And I also got the sense that from these prophecies that the current situation in France is basically a chastisement to itself. I mean, we get what we deserve if we have given ourselves over to secularism. You know, the, the French revolutionary uh, motto of fraternity and liberty and all the rest, if we've given ourselves over to the free, Freemason uh, philosophy and theology, well, then we get what we deserve, and what we see now it seems to be what we deserve. Would you agree to that? Quite so. And uh, this motto of Fraternité, Liberté, Égalité, yes, it sounds lovely, but what was not known, particularly by foreigners, is that in France, during the revolutions and many, many years thereafter, some people appear to be more equal than others, no? more free than others, more fraternal than others. This was nothing less than a mirage, a falsehood that was architected principally by Freemasonry. You know, I regret to say, uh, but even with uh, the apparitions uh, of Lafrode, with Marie Julie Janie, this French stigmatist, who was an extraordinary lady, uh, her apparitions uh, and her case is probably the largest chapter in my book, along with that of Fatima. But it appears clearly that uh, heaven is condemning Freemasonry, all Freemasonic lodges, as the enemy of the church. And by the way, a brief parenthesis. The Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, that since the creation and existence of Freemasonry in 1717, has condemned nothing less than 25 times Freemasonic lodges and has excommunicated every and any member thereof. John Paul II uh, condemned and excommunicated Freemasonry nothing less than three times during his pontificate. Mm. Yeah. Therefore, and St. Michael the Archangel, beg upon. I was going to say, uh, you may not know, I, I was a Freemason. I belonged to the Blue Lodge. I was a Master Mason before I became Catholic. My father is still a, an active uh, Freemason, 32nd degree Scottish Rite. So I have some history with, with the Masons. I studied their, their history. I studied their lore and their myths that they like to perpetuate. And that was part of the reason why I had a conversation earlier this week about Notre Dame and its restoration project. Because when I first saw the artist rendering uh, of what they're going to do to Notre Dame, I said, that looks like a Freemason Lodge. I mean, the, the, the checkerboard square in the floor was a clear signal to me, like, that's exactly what the lodge looks like. The altar, the altar that they want to put out there, the, the post-Vatican II Novus Ordo altar, it, it, it reminded me of something you might see, you know, this little, this little tiny little square thing uh, in the middle of the lodge, you just everything about it screamed to me Freemason, and uh, it breaks my heart to see the eldest daughter of the church uh, still captive to this progressive, materialistic, communist, socialist, you know, diabolic philosophy, and they've given themselves over to it absolutely completely. I mean, I, I just can't understand. I mean, I didn't grow up Catholic. I didn't grow up in a Catholic country. So it boggles the mind uh, to, for a foreigner, an outsider like myself, to try to understand why the French people think the way they do today. They seem to have truly abandoned. Is that true? Is that a is that a truth, or is that just a headline news news cycle interpretation? Are there more faithful Catholics in France than I give credit to? That's a very good question. Yes. And there is a very large portion of it that decided to remain silent. Unfortunately, the power today that is in, a, in place in France is occupied by those enemies of anti-Christian churches, pro-socio-communist, Islamo um, organization 
the new best party in France, which is led principally by Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who is a flagrant communist, pro-Muslim, uh, anti-Christian. Notwithstanding, uh, there is a great majority of Frenchmen at every election that decide not to show up. Every year, every time there is an election, the greatest it shows that the greatest majority of Frenchmen is so disgusted by the political spectrum, decide not to vote. I myself, I live in the United States for the time being, although I travel across the Atlantic all the time. Whenever I'm here, I always vote in the French consulate. No? So, but I tell you this, um, uh, whenever you are declaring or stating or announcing the coming of the future king immediately in France, you will be called a neo-fascist or a neo-Nazi or far right wingist. No? Now, for those of you, uh, there will be people who will listen to this and probably will accuse me to be one. I just wish to, to state the fact that I come from a very old traditional French family whose uh, every generation member have taken the uniform and the weapons to defend the colors. I have a, uh, an uncle who was a hero, a companion of the liberation under General de Gaulle who fought the Nazis. Wow. So I've already received a multitude of criticism with, to which I'm royally indifferent. But I simply will simply state one motto of those Frenchmen who died martyrs in the region of Vendée fighting the Republicans and remaining to the end uh, faithful to the King of France. Uh, my soul to God, my life to the King, my heart to Mary, my honor to myself. This was the motto of the Frenchmen who remained loyal to the Church and to the King, and this is the motto which today will return back to those Frenchmen who will join the King at the appointed time. I want to ask another question before I get back to specifically about La Salette and the French monarch prophecy. And that is just trying to, again, trying to understand. So if I think, if I contemplate, how do you get a people, a country to decide that it's, it's okay to chop off the head of their King? Like if, if I feel like that has to con like that, the water has to boil over time to get to that point. I feel is it like what was going on in France that the people would come to uh, that and they would perpetuate such atrocities during the French Revolution. In other words, I guess what, what was what sparked, what changed in France that led them down the road that they would embrace this? Was there an event? Was it the was it the Protestant Revolution that kicked things off in France? Was it politics? What was it that happened in France? that would ultimately lead to the people being okay with chopping the head off of their king? That's a very good question. And what many people do not know about the, that part of French history was that uh, those revolutionaries in Paris represented a sheer minority of the French population who were living in other cities or in the countryside. A sheer minority. It all started with political upheaval that were started in paradoxically, I mean, it's a paradox, by the French nobility, some of whom were even from the Lafayette family, others from the Destin, others, as I mentioned, the, the branch, the royal branch of the family d'Orléans, no? among which Philippe d'Egalité was the sole responsible party, was the vote that condemned his cousin, uh, Louis XVI, to the uh, execution, to the execution of the um, of Marie Antoinette. Now they've accused them of the of infamies, which were absolutely untrue. That they were um, irresponsible with the economy, and that the French people were starving. There were some difficulties indeed in Paris. Indeed, every for many generations, many family, many French kings have spent fortunes for the um, Chateau de Versailles and for other things. Certainly, but what is not known is when. There were uh, um, hungry people coming to the gates of the Chateau de Versailles, hungry women with their children uh, um, in their arms. Louis the Sixteenth, when the chief of the guards uh, asked for orders if they should open fire, Louis the Sixteenth said, "No, open the gates. I want to speak with them." And when one of these women, uh, which was dirty, with the breast exposed, giving it to a child, uh, tell, told the king, "Your Majesty, we are hungry." The king immediately, first of all, said, welcome to my home, my humble home. Of course, what can I do for you, madame? And he immediately ordered his pâtissier and cooks to bring the food to all the people who arrived. Wow. There was an, 
a lack of insouciance, a lack of uh, knowledge of what was really going on. But when the king finally realized he was exposed to the French deputies, he said, very well, I agree to instore uh, democracy, to bring forth elections for a, a Republican uh, government, and I will simply appear as a figurehead of, like very much, the Kingdom of England today. But no, all the free masons, because the main architect, and I cannot stress this enough, and for the historians who know the history of France, they will confirm what I'm stating. The main roots, the angular stone, now the cornerstones of this upheaval in Paris came and was installed by Freemasonic lodges who had other plans for France, a different regime. And as a form of proof, the majority of the French people were in favor of their king. They loved their king and their queen and the little princess. No? The region of Vendée and part of Brittany rose against the horrors, the tyranny, of the French Republic and fought, even bringing extraordinary ex or superior officers like Charette and others to take arms and push the Republicans out of their regime, screaming, Vive la France, Vive le Roi, Vive Dieu. And they were putting in, as an insignia on their breast the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they had success even when they were outnumbered 11 to 1. Mm. But what the horrors, what the Republicans committed against the French civilian population, women and children, is comparable to the Holocaust that the Nazis did against the Jews. I'm not going to go into them. It's too barbaric. It's an abomination. But it, it's, as a Frenchman, it makes me ashamed to call myself mm. one, just in remembrance of this past. But it makes me proud mm. to think of those who have fallen uh, for rightfulness, for the tradition of yesteryears, and for the flags of our fathers and theirs before them. Yeah. He will return. You know, he will come back. It's fast. What part of what's fascinating to me about all of this is I have a, a devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I have a particular fondness for studying how Her Hernan Cortez was used by Our Lady and by God to conquer Satan himself in the Aztec Empire, which led to, as we know, millions of converts at a time where millions were leaving in Europe leaving the abandoning the true faith, millions were being brought into the faith. Now, today, fast forward, Mexico is under siege by the devil. And I have a, a theory that Our Lady will reconquista uh, Mexico in the end times, and amazing things will happen through that. And I'm starting to get the sense, and I'm kind of new to the game when it comes to this prophecy of the French monarch, I'm starting to get to the sense that the same is true in France, that there's a divine plan here for the French monarch. And I believe uh, under Our Lady of La Salette, as just like I believe under Our Lady of Guadalupe. Let me read a little bit too, uh, set this next question up. January 31st, 1903, the call of the king. Oh, my children, this is Our Lady speaking. Oh, my children, pray, pray, indulge in penance. I can no longer retain divine justice. Pray for the king who is coming in these days. You live under a regime of crime, but France will go to the sacred heart. You must come to this place. Uh, and it says, Tilly Sur, and I'm not going to say it correctly, Tilly Sur Sures, I'm not sure how to say that. And pray for the king to come. This is the monarchy which will ensure the recovery of France in a new era because the royalty of France is traditionally a Christian regime. Now, I quoted that because... <clears throat> There seems to be some significance to that location, Tilly. Can you tell us what is Tilly? Why is that significant? Yes, and I thank you for mentioning that. That's my home country. That's Normandy. This comes from an apparition site that took place uh, sometimes after uh, that of La Salette, which, by the way, has likewise been approved formally by the Roman Catholic Church. So this is approved. And this is a second apparition site that approved which calls forth for the coming of the king. So it has a tremendous uh, significance. What's more, according to this particular apparition site, there will be a basilica that will be built there after the end of uh, the Third World War. France, according to revelations, will be uh, ravaged uh, for the greater part of this Third World War. There is greater detail as to the activities of the, this French king, uh, Henry V of the Cross, for the next chapter of the, after that, chapter three, which is La Fraude with Marie-Julie Janie. The details are extraordinary, extraordinary. To give you a brief resume, because I know we're making a race against the clock, 
but to go very quickly according to the revelations which heaven our lord jesus christ and michael the archangel and the blessed virgin mary has given to the french stigmatist marie julie jani in confirmation to the visionary of tilly and of la salette there will be a third world war that will come from uh, eastern europe through a sort of blitzkrieg very quickly all the defenses of what we know today nate as nato will be wiped out and because of sheer exhaustion of ammunitions which will have been given somewhere else ah surprise ukraine perhaps the russians will very quickly uh, wipe out all the defenses from the yellow russian um, frontier all the way to the ruhr the rhine river there there will be wow. a very brief pause the russians will cross austria northern italy while the muslims will invade and disembark in southern italy south of france and the costa del sol and andalusia in spain the russians will afterwards throw the dice because the french politics being a nuclear power is that the french dissuasion will hit hard with nuclear weapons to any nations around the world who will step foot on french soils the russians will take a bet that they will not and they will be right they will cross the rhine river and will attack through three principal directions the first one according to marie julie jani will not be paris remarkably enough but the city of orleans and afterwards not the second greatest attack will be in paris which will resist on the outskirts for 45 days the third one will go through switzerland and central france and will meet with a disembarkment of muslim coalition forces and uh, there will be a front france will be will not be totally conquered but the western part all the atlantic coast will remain under french control brittany and vendee and part of normandy will resist until finally the french king will be called will come to france will take command of the remnants of nato and of the french forces and through a miracle because we will be outgunned and outnumbered through a miracle and through the assistance of heaven we'll push back the russians outside french countries uh, but and we'll push back the russians all the way to italy the king of spain will likewise push back the muslims at that moment the french crown where the french king will be crowned in the city and the cathedral of reims and uh, will uh, likewise uh, continue a new campaign to in northern italy with the assistance the small assistance of the spanish king the americans will not come to our rescue because they will not be able to wow that's prophecy and they will wow. liberate rome and installed and put back an angelic pope on the seat of saint peter that's a okay so where is all of that in the timeline of the end times at what point when does this happen in connection to the the coming of the Antichrist, the tr Great Tribulation, and, of course, the final judgment? So how far removed is what you just described from all the rest? That's a very good question that many theologians to this day are wondering. But, uh, again, I, although I worked with Father Laurentin for a few years, I am hardly not even the shadow of the expert he was, naturally. Um, but on the book, I, I take the liberty of uh, installing a timeline of sorts. The Virgin Mary said uh, that everything will begin, uh, these events will take place when a Queen of England uh, will, be, will, will no longer be Queen of England and will be replaced. Uh, she mentioned that there will be an implosion of the um, United Kingdom into four sovereign nations. Uh, obviously, it's not difficult to understand. Scotland, Wales, England, and uh, very and close, Ireland. yeah. Right. Uh, but incredibly enough, I will give you a tremendous piece of information here. And the piece of information is the apparitions of La Fraude through Marie Julie is unquestionably, along with La Salette, the one that gives us a tremendous clue for some years in, at hand. In, one, in two particular uh, messages that our Lord gives to Marie Julie Jani, he says, the beginning of the unraveling of these events will start and will begin between the year 80 and 83. Now, I know this is very uh, uh, <laughs> bizarre and calls maybe for Sherlock Holmes of sorts to try to de decipher this information. What does it mean, 80 and 83? And blimey, I have to tell you, it took me a very long time to come to a conclusion myself. I was wondering, hmm. what could it be? Could it be from the 19th century, 20th century? And then I thought to myself, no, it makes no sense. It has to be from a point of reference in history, particularly an, an important part of Marie Julie Janis' life, from which those 80 years must be counted for. And then I remembered that at the end, our Lord said, 
that the day will come when the tomb of Marie Jelijani will be exhumed and her body will be found incorrupt and her heart beating. So wow. I thought to myself, could it be from the year of her death? So she died in 1941 during the German occupation. So I added mm -hmm. uh, 20, uh, 80 years to 1941 and I arrived to the year 2021. I added 83 to 1941, and I arrived to 2024. So what happened in 2021? It was the, um, the, um, the top of the pandemic of uh, uh, COVID-19. It was then the first time in the history of the church that every church around the globe closed their doors. It was the beginning of everything, of a new chapter in our history. 2022, what possibly could, could have been happening that could call for this? to be brought forth to their attention. If they are unthinkable. The invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the beginning of something whose, which end is not even in sight yet. We're not even seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. In fact, this could be the catalyst of something considerably greater and a confirmation of the ongoing prophecies of Marie Julie Janine. Now, 2023, we're living it. God knows in the remaining months what's going to happen. And 2024, mm. only God knows. But to me, and I wrote this in the book, that's yeah. the only point of reference that I could think of that our Lord meant. Well, uh, scary is the word that comes to mind, but that's not probably an appropriate word. God's holy will be done. Trusting in him in a trustful surrender to divine providence is the answer to all life's problems. But nonetheless, so we have... Scotland is pushing for its independence. It wants to go return back to the EU now that the UK has left. So, you know, that it, it, it's, it's been going back and forth over the years, Scotland's uh, you know, desire for independence. And I've, I've actually done some reporting on that, interviewing on that. And there's a bit of a nefarious crew that's behind pushing for uh, Scotland's independence over there as well. They have, they have an ulterior agenda, uh, I remember speaking to Dorothy Cummins McLean about that topic a couple months ago. And then, of course, right now, I mean, if you go on to uh, Radio Free Europe on Twitter or Catholic Arena or other places, you'll see videos of military aged males coming in boatloads from Africa into Italy and other parts, you know, landing and, of course, getting access to the EU. And as we all know, they've been terrorizing places in Southern Italy. They've been terrorizing France for a very long time. Uh, we just, we just covered the stories of the riots in France because of a police officer who shot a young uh, migrant from a Northern Africa. And then they started burning the place down. And of course, France is already uh, in the practice uh, Paris, Paris, especially already in the practice of, of, uh, protesting at least once or twice a year if they get together for big protests in Paris, it seems, while Macron parties it off at, uh, at, at the ball. You know, he just goes and has a great time. He sort of ignores everything going on there. You know, so there's so many, there's so many points to all of this that do seem to line up. The Ukraine story is obviously very, very troubling. I personally, as an American, uh, am struggling with this concept of giving them $80 billion of taxpayer money to support uh, the Zelensky government over there when in American towns uh, we are dying of fentanyl and drug overdoses that are being laced with poisons that come from China through Mexico and our southern border, which is wide open and receiving droves and droves and droves of hundreds of thousands and millions of illegal migrants coming across the border. Right now, just down the street, literally just down the street from me, is a neighborhood, the largest na the largest colony in the country of 70,000 illegal migrants. They're making it as easy as possible for these migrants to set up their, their lives there. They're giving them mortgages. They're letting them build shanties. It doesn't matter. The police aren't going in there to to sort of supervise. So drugs, prostitution, child sex trafficking is all going to be an issue over there. And there's no charity in that uh, from a Catholic perspective. So I see all of this. Then, of course, China. We haven't talked much about China. I imagine China is the ally of Russia as well as Iran and the, northern Africa in uh, the axis of powers there. So was there anything particular to China or the Asian uh, empire in any of these prophecies that you might be able to recall? 
No, uh, the provinces that I covered were uh, La Salette, uh, Tilly, La Frode, Fatima, including the, f the famous and complete Third Secret of Fatima. I uh, included as well other apparition sites like uh, Lady of Good Success in Quito, which also has been approved, and others which are still under investigation, like the one of Garabandal and Medjugorje, which have not been condemned nor approved. So, um, but uh, in these apparition sites that I know of, no, there has not been any mention of China. However, if you check other apparition sites, uh, like for instance, Emmerich, uh, sister, uh, the famous mystic Emmerich, and other visionaries, uh, there are some mentions of Asian, um, yes, a, a war that will take place in the future in the Pacific theater, unquestionably, and indeed, Regarding today the situation with Macron and the reason for all these immigrants to be allowed in, which I suspect is the same for the Americans, is simply the left wing, I mean the socialist, uh, the left center and the communist uh, the equivalent, well, something like the, equivalent, the most equivalent thing that you could be compared with your American political spectrum will be your Democratic Party. The purpose in France to let all these immigrants come in is to have votes who will vote for them. Because right now, the great majority of French people uh, are against, are equivalent to your Republican Party, are to the right party of, of the political spectrum. So for them, the only way to survive is to get new people, give them papers that say that they are French people and French citizens, and have them vote for them. It's the mm -hmm. principal purpose of the allowing of opening of borders for, uh, for these immigrants. The problem is, that there is now in France, in a population of 67 million people, about 23, 24 million that are of Muslim or Northern okay. African origins. It's a tremendous fraction of the French population. The French people uh, of, that are of French origins, and this is not a question of racism. I have no problem at all with people from Northern Africa or elsewhere to become French citizens. Being the nephew of a free French officer, during the war, and uh, a companion of the liberation. I can tell you, just the Battle of Birakem in 1942, they were, uh, we were fighting divisions of Rome with French, free Frenchmen that came from Senegal, from Tahiti, from the French colonies. They were wearing white gloves, charging with bayonet at the cannon of their guns, screaming Vive la France against uh, Nazi tanks. Those were real Frenchmen. The One of the first companions of the liberation was uh, Governor Eboué, who was from the French Martinique, Governor of Chad. So I, it's not a matter of racism. It's a matter of a culture trying to take over and erase another, which is by two times, uh, has been two twice in France for over a thousand years. For over 2,000 years, France had a culture which has been passed from father to son, from father to son. And now these newcomers are trying to eliminate Christianity and replace it with Islam and particularly an in, intolerant Islam with the Sharia. The situation in France is dear, and the French government, and led by Emmanuel Macron, is trying with all its might to try to kill those fours, those little fires, so as to avoid a civil war. And no one, particularly in the woke uh, new uh, culture of today, is trying to make or throw oil in the fire. The situation is a reality, the one I am explaining to you. As a Frenchman, I live the majority of my life there. In France, the tension is so dear. First in Paris, you feel that you're no longer in Paris. You feel you're in a city in the Middle East. No one dares to speak. No one dares to go to the metro subway after 6 o'clock. The situation is extremely dangerous. And this situation you mentioned about this young man that got shot by a French policeman was nothing less than a pretext for the Muslims to, to ravage Paris, to try to steal and uh, attack shops and steal uh, in an in a inexorable manner. The French government knows mm. that. The French knows that as well. There are a thousand churches, basilicas, Catholic cemeteries that are being disfigured and attacked every year by, mu by Muslims. How do you explain that over a third of the Jewish population, French Israeli population in France, left France? in the past 15 years to go to Israel because they know that the tension with the Muslim is so tense that there's been so many attacks against their people. They cannot continue living in France. The story of the Bataclan in 2016, you'll remember. 
when openly this group of uh, Islamic commandos were shooting with Kalashnikov in the middle of Paris. I do. People yeah. less than a meter away. It's a scandal. And all this is being kept under the carpet yeah. so as not to excite passions. This is oh. a called passionless yeah. reality. Another thing you cover quite extensively, and I've heard you cover this, is uh, uh, Our Lady of Akita, the third secret of Fatima. Something that I've been saying for a long time that uh, if Our Lady does not contradict, in the prophecies, Our Lady does not contradict the church of her son, of her divine child. She does not contradict, she does not create a confrontation with, direct confrontation with the the bishops, the priests, the clergy that serve in the court of her son, who is the king of kings and the lord of lords. However, um, when someone closes a door, she opens a window. And uh, so if, if you're not going to reveal the third secret that has been communicated by heaven and do so at the time that she asks or to, to be done, because it's the will of God to do so, well, then she's going to go around that. She's going to find other ways. And I feel like that is the case in uh, Our Lady of Akita. I believe there are other apparitions, too. I think, our, I think it was sent to that in Our Lady of Lourdes, uh, La Salette, uh, but Akita most strongly. And then, of course, I go back to um, Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres in Ecuador, and I think of the uh, apparitions and the messages she received and how prophetic they were. I think of Blessed Elizabeth Conori Mora in, in Rome, uh, in the 19th century, and how vivid she had her visions of a time when cardinals would threaten the life of the Pope and bloodshed would, would uh, fall in, in the St. Peter's Square, and how cardinal against cardinal. Now, this, it's, it's always been the case that bishops have fought bishops in the church. It's always been a thing. But maybe you can speak to that, because while, while France, the eldest daughter of the church, is practically burning down, I hear crickets from the bishops. And at a time <laughs> when the bishops in France should be strong and courageous and speak up, uh, instead they put out pictures of how they're going to renovate Notre Dame to look like a Freemason lodge. Like, this is scandalous. Like, are, they suppress the traditional Latin mass at a time when they should be leveraging the glory, the power, the beauty, and the might of the patrimony of Holy Mother Church. They should be bringing these weapons to the battlefield. Instead, they suppress them, and they seem to perpetuate uh, what is coming our way, and many souls will be lost. And that seems more tragic to me than just about anything else. Maybe you could speak to that. So, I, I wish to say um, the following before proceeding forward. Uh, in spite of what is happening today, the scandals, the ongoing scandals that took place even in 1960 by John XXIII when he refused to obey the orders of the Virgin Mary to reveal publicly the third secret of Fatima, what's going on today in Paris with Notre Dame, the control of France and of many nations by Freemasonic organizations and Luciferian sects. We have to remain very much, um, and I'm talking to your telespectators, your viewers, at ease. Remain in peace, because at the end of the day, and like the Virgin said in Fatima, the Immaculate Heart of Mary will triumph. And there is nothing, nothing, that the enemies of God will be able to do to stop that. The war is already won. Simply we have to go, like the Passion of the Christ, before the resurrection, the Church has got to go through the, its Via Crucis, through its crucifixion mm -hmm. and burial. But at the end, there will be a resurrection. But for a resurrection, we have to go through the Passion, the same way our Lord did. In response to your question, uh, Akita, yes, that was a confirmation of indeed the third secret of Fatima. Remember that the request of the Blessed Virgin Mary through Sister Lucia dos Santos was this. The third secret of Fatima was to be revealed publicly either at the moment of death or immediately thereafter of Sister Lucia dos Santos, or at the latest, at the latest, by 1960. Now, why 1960? Remember, this information was given in 1943. There were no Second Vatican Council yet in effect or being planned. But those were the instructions of the Virgin Mary. When John XXIII, surrounded by, amongst others, His Eminence Cardinal Ottaviani, 
and by other um, cardinals and translators from Portuguese to Italian for uh, Pope John the Twenty-Third to be able to understand. When he read the second envelope of the third secret of Fatima, for there were two indeed, the first one was the vision, which has been revealed indeed in June of the year 2000 by the Vatica Vatican authorities. The second one included and was inserted a text of the Blessed Virgin Mary, including the real third secret of Fatima. When he read it, John the Twenty-Third, he became white as an aspirin, as we see in French, no? and he put it back, terrified or alarmed, closed wow. the seal and, and simply stated before his witnesses, this message is not for our time. Now, I submit to you that this is another scandal of sorts, for indeed, did John the Twenty-Third think himself wiser than heaven? Did he possibly think that heaven could not foresee the future and made a mistake with the timing he's given through his first emissary, the Blessed Virgin Mary? Of course not. He took a tremendous amount of gall, even if for uh, the Vicar of Christ to decide that heaven's instructions were not appropriate. Right. But he was not the only one to be blamed. His successors as well. Paul VI did exactly the same thing. John Paul I, whose demise, shall we say, is more than suspicious. And I ask to those who have ears to understand, no? Um, didn't have very much time to do the right thing. John Paul II wanted to do the correct thing, but was not really able until the year 2000. But, and I suspect it was against his wishes, only the first half of the third secret was revealed upon his insistence, no? Now in Akita, there was, uh, through Sister Sasagawa, Agnes Sasagawa, a religious nun who was deaf and miraculously healed by the Blessed Virgin Mary. She was given, among many other messages, a prophetic message on the 56th anniversary of the last apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, the, on the October the 13th, 1973, which was the 56th anniversary as well of the miracle of the sun. Now, and this message was brought forth in person by His Excellency Bishop Ito to the then Prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, His Eminence Cardinal Ratzinger, future Pope Benedict XVI. Now, having worked with Father Lorenta, as I mentioned earlier, there is one thing that will always stay with me as long as I'm able to open my eyes. He told me this, Xavier, keep in mind that all true apparition sites and true, all true Marian apparition cases uh, will always be subject to assault by the enemy, always, through defamation, through ridicule, etc., etc. And indeed, Akita was no exception to that rule. Uh, Sister Sasagawa, the sisters of the convent, even His Excellency Bishop Ito, who was an extraordinary, remarkable man, were attacked, defamed, insulted, accused. And of course, all this sheer mediocrity arrived to the ears of Cardinal Ratzinger, who was perplexed. He didn't know what to think, but my goodness, blast, he told himself, this is an awful lot of accusations. How could we possibly, we, the Vatican, uh, declare Akita worthy of belief under these circumstances. Let's place ourselves at the feet of the cross and let God do his will. Bishop mm. Ito, finally, after having made a dossier with all the tears of the statue of wood of Our Lady of All Nations that was present in the convent of Akita, uh, having studied the blood, the tears, the sweat, even the, the stigmata that took place with Sister Sasagawa, organized with medical organizations in Akita that were chosen by Bishop Ito because they were atheists. So wow. that no one could possibly accuse them of having organized anything amongst Christian circles. He organized the dossier. He was convinced. He took the first flight, Tokyo, Rome. He took what the Americans, I think, called the red eye, yes? <laughs> and took a rendezvous with Cardinal Ratzinger. He met with him. Cardinal Ratzinger was perplexed, received him. And Bishop Ito explained the circumstances, uh, all the mediocrities that uh, they suffered, the accusation, etc., etc. But he brought the evidence. And then he gave the last message given to Sister Sasagawa 
on October 13th, 1973. And for all your viewers who have a computer, obviously they have, check that message. I have it in my book. That message yes. once, uh, Cardinal Hasinger uh, read it, stated, mm. Bishop Ito, there is no further need to continue this discussion. There will be no further investigation of Akita. The matter will be closed. Imagine the reaction of poor Bishop Ito, who was alarmed and said, but your eminence, you didn't give me a chance. Please let me explain. Please read the findings we found. Cardinal Hudson just stopped Bishop Ito and said, no, Excellency, you do not seem to understand. You know, the investigation will stop today because as of today, the congregation of the doctrine of the faith will declare the apparitions of Akita as being worthy of belief. Bishop Ito asked, but why? What made you change your mind ever so quickly, Your Eminence? And Cardinal Hatzinger responded, because in effect, this message you brought me, given by the Blessed Virgin May on October 13, 1973, is in fact the third secret of Fatima, stated with a few yeah. variations in different, but it is the third secret of Fatima. And I submit to you, if you read the message, it has absolutely nothing to do with the vision that was released on June 2000, which, by the way, I have to admit, was part of the third secret of Fatima, but it was accompanied yeah. with this message. You know, I was just rem uh, reminded, uh, you know, again, just to kind of state what I was saying before was, all right, church, if you're not going to do your part, which you were commanded to do, I'm going to find a way around that. Akita was an example of it, as you just stated very well. Our Lady of Revelation and uh, 1947, Bruno Cornicolia, Trey Fontane, just outside Rome, received a miraculous revelation. He, was, he had plotted to kill Pope Pius XII. It's a story I've told many times, and, and uh, I, I have a, a playlist of videos from Father Wolf of the FSSP who tells the story of Bruno and our lead revelation very well. There's a direct link to the third secret of Fatima in the revelation that she gave to him. She commanded Bruno, after she converted him, uh, on the spot, she commanded Bruno to pr to provide this message to Pope Pius XII to warn him of, uh, similarly to what the Third Secret of Fatima actually is. And even though Our Lady, the Queen of Heaven and Earth, has gone out of her way so many times in all of these prophecies, all these revelations, through all of these seers, all these mystics, she had to warn the faithful, and yet we like knuckleheads never listen we don't actually do the the fasting and penance that uh, she asks us to do at fatima let alone anywhere else and we and i bring this up to say i've heard you say this in other interviews and this is rings true to me to uh, elizabeth Kanori mora's revelations and something she said prophecies are one thing what may actually happen could be a different thing it depends on how we respond to these things, these warnings. I got to tell you, it feels like we're not responding. I mean, right now in America, over 65% of Catholics in America do not believe in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. The U.S. bishops, in response to that, are putting on a big party to the tune of $28 million uh, one year from right now. They're going to gather in Indianapolis, and they're all going to get together. They're going to hold hands. They're going to sing Kumbaya. It's going to be a great party. Everybody's going to have a good time. What won't happen is that more Catholics will then all of a sudden start believing in the church's teaching. They won't return the altar rails. They won't do ad orientum. They won't do communion on the tongue with a patent. But they will gather and sing Kumbaya. It seems bizarre to me that when heaven warns us we not only don't listen, we don't respond. We we, we want we're materialists, Xavier. That's all we are. As the average Catholic wants blue skies, low humidity, and our kids to go to a great college. That's about the extent of our desires in life. How come we don't listen? No, look, I will tell you another thing that we discussed with Father Long ten years ago. Right now, what we're talking is so much more than just a radio show. Very few entities, very few theologians today in the church are aware of, of this situation of the impending crisis and particularly of the accuracy of the admonitions that the Blessed Virgin Mary is doing. I do believe perhaps this will um, inspire a smirk in some of your auditors, but I have the sincere conviction that all those that are watching this show, who heard your, your radio show earlier or before even with the other shows that you, you are entertaining and you're making, 
that there is a reason for this. We are really reaching a period of time in our history where these particular moments we are living will be referred to as a point of reference in history. Very much like in 1917 when the Virgin Mary announced when you mentioned the importance of what is really a prophecy, an admonition, a warning. The Virgin was very clear in Fatima. If you do not return to my son, if you do not convert, there will be a second world war and Russia will spread her errors throughout the world. The purpose of these apparitions in 1917 was not to scare people. It was to tell them, you're driving at 100 kilometers per hour straight towards the wall. If you don't change the direction of your uh, wheel, 45 degrees, you will crash. And what happened? It's true what you said, that people don't seem to be paying attention, are singing Kumbaya and all that sort of rubbish. Why? Whose fault is that? The church was called to echo these admonitions, this warning for people to pray, for people to convert. And how, convert how? That is always the question I'm being confronted with. The version was very clear, very explicit about that as well. Conversion, she explained, must take place principally for the following cornerstones. Reading and living in peace with serenity, all the Holy Scriptures, the Gospels, the teachings of one's laws. Not just reading them, living them. Also applying all the sacraments of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. The only Christian church that has been founded by Christ upon Peter. All the other Christian church, although we owe them respect, were founded by men. Was it that Christ was wrong? He made a mistake by founding his church upon Peter? Of course not. And the Virgin asks us to visit and practice the sacraments of the Catholic Church, particularly to convert through confession, preferably every first Saturdays of every month, and to go to communion. That is the key of salvation. But unlike what we hear in Rome, not communion à la va-vite, as we say in French, but digne, digne and properly prepared. If you suspect to have committed a very serious and grave sin, a mortal sin, do not receive the Holy Eucharist. You receive many graces if you commit a, a, a mortal sin and present yourself in this manner to the priest by refusing the Holy Eucharist, declaring yourself unworthy, and then going back to your seat, having afterwards confession and returning for communion. You must be properly prepared, as St. Paul taught us in the Holy Scriptures. This is very important. If you do not, and if you receive a communion simply with good spirits, although you've committed adultery yesterday, or you've done harm to another one in an unforgiving way, and receive communion, you'd be guilty of the sin of receiving a sacrilegious communion. The Virgin is not, or God is not, a severe God. They are loving souls. God is a loving God. The Virgin Mary is asking imploringly, with the love of a mother to her children, save yourselves while there is still time by confessing. Preferably the first Saturdays of the month, receive the body of my son Jesus Christ. You know, those are the things that the church should have been teaching us and repeating to us since the first apparitions of the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary has not come to add any more revelation that has already been brought forth through the Holy Gospels. Never. She's come to say exactly the same thing she said 2,000 years in a little village called Cana. Do everything my son tells you. That is the message of the Virgin Mary, which heaven thought it was necessary to repeat to the faithful because the church today has failed and failed miserably mm. to do so the way it was supposed to and instead decided to hide the secret of La Salette, which was found by accident in 1999, over a century thereafter, by hiding the third secret of Fatima, thinking to be wiser and possibly more intelligent perhaps than heaven or God. No? Hiding and for forcing Sister Sasagawa or Sister Lucia dos Santos to a vow of silence. Why? Why, when heaven explicitly requested for these messages to be brought forth to humanity for them to convert, to change the course of history, like in Nineveh, like in Nineveh, the decree was formally made. Nineveh was to be pulverized, wiped out because of the sin of the king and of its people, because of Jonas and because the echoing of the message properly echoed, the people converted enough to change the decree of chastisement upon the city of Nineveh. And that is what a prophecy is. It is not a condemnation. It is not an ultimatum. It is an admonition brought forth by heaven to the faithful to change while there is still time to avert what is 
coming. For God is indeed Christ. He is and God is a God of mercy, unquestionably. Let's not forget. Yeah. He's Amen. a God of justice as well. Amen. Will the true faithful lessen as the increasing heretical church demands we compromise our faith for the sake of the feelings of the unfaithful? We need the renewal of the church. Well, I certainly uh, want to echo what Benedict the Sixteenth said when he was Ratzinger that the church is going to become a small remnant, which kind of leads me to one of the questions in my mind about the French monarch prophecies in that you talk about war in Europe. You described it with great detail, actually, during the conversation. How many, what's the, what's the loss of human life in that conflict? Do you have a sense of, like, how many people, like in World War II, the loss of life was staggering. How many tens and tens of millions of human persons lost their lives during the World War II conflict? And how many out of those, you, you begin to wonder, died without being able to repent for their sins and confess and get right with God. And then therefore, because they died in mortal sin are in hell now for all eternity. The same thing strikes, strikes my mind about a future pending world war three, which I have to believe would be a magnitude greater than the loss of life in world war two. Do you have any sense of the scale of the conflict that's described in these prophecies? Right. So, and it is shocking. Marie Julie Jani uh, gave an explanation and uh, a very accurate amount uh, on number now that is to come. Uh, you asked me, I cannot avoid, avoid it, avoid the question. It's in the book as well. But Marie Julie Jani was told, and she repeated twice, that the Virgin Mary told her that in France, half of the French population will perish. In the world, wow. and in the world, three quarters of the population will perish. Of the whole world? Oui. Three quarters of all people everywhere will perish. Three quarters. That the is a mind-blowing my... number. Yes. The version my through my religion is given enormous amount of details. The reason for this will not be only due to nuclear exchange between nations, but between, of course, due to a chastisement that will take place, principally not only just through nuclear war, but also because of the spreading of a different diseases, one in particular called the burning plague. This burning plague will make COVID look like a picnic in comparison, <laughs> will be contagious and will fall, make many fall victims through uh, contagion that will be even airborne. However, in the book, through Marie-Julie Jani, she's given, although she stated that um, the art of human medicine will not be able to counteract or beat this uh, uh, punishment, she's given a remedy. And it is in the book, it, I will tell you, because the only thing that, that I care about is for people to be prepared. And that's the uh, hoth, forgive my ghastly pronunciation, the hawthorn <laughs> leaf, the hawthorn leaf. She said that will be the only thing where put into a boiling water for a particular period of time, she said 14 minutes, that if taken in time, consumed three times a, a day and, and or applied on the body three times a day, if it's taken in time, you will be able to serve yourself. If it's taken too late, it will simply alleviate the sufferings. There are other remedies she's given forth through Marie-Julie Jani, which are all in the book. But what is to come is uh, it's something, it's a major devastating chastisement caused principally by humanity. God also will inflict a chastisement at the end. That will be the last chastisement. And I know what some will say. This sounds very much like a Hollywood plot. I, see, I admit to you, I confess to you, I was one of those. I had a tremendous difficulty believing what I am about to tell you now. But it's been confirmed by Saint Padre Pio by La Salette, by other mystics and saints and visionaries. And we're talking about the three days of darkness. That, according to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to Marie Julie and others, and to Padre Pio, that will be the last chastisement that God will inflict upon man, where all the enemies of religion, particularly the enemies of his church, will be um, chastised, eliminated 
by quote unquote mm. the angel destroyer as per the orders of God. This was said in La Salette, approved apparition site. This was said in La Frode, informally approved by the local bishop. This was said in other places, including by Padre Pio, with further with great instructions on how to protect, how to prepare yourself for the three days of darkness for the faithful. So in response again to your question, three quarters of the world population will perish. Wow. Okay, let's talk about timing then uh, real quick. So we have the French monarch coming at a time of great upheaval and war throughout Europe, a world war, it would seem. Three quarters perish. Does the three days of darkness come after the, the, the or is it a portion uh, of this whole event? Good question. This, will, this is how the events will take place. The war will take place. The revolutions, first of all, will take place in France, followed by Italy, Germany and England. Uh, the government of France will flee Paris. At that moment, uh, everyone was, the version said, for all the faithful to leave Paris quickly, because there will be immediately after this war, civil war and takeover of the French government by an archaic and an anarchy, an, uh, the anarchy government. There will be the war, the part uh, of the French invasion, or rather Russian invasion, Muslim invasion from the south, which will be stopped by the French army, the arrival of the king, the rejection of the invaders from France, which will be devastated. Paris in the process will be destroyed through two nuclear bombs, one which will be launched by the Russians from the city of Orléans, which will still be occupied, and the other from the city of Blois. Paris will be pulverized and will succumb into a um, bottomless crater, where in the future, according to the Virgin Mary, a father will take his son uh, at the border of this crater and say to his son, son, here used to lie a great city. Now, Marseille will also be vanquished and will uh, sink in the Mediterranean Sea. All the major cities in France will be wiped out. But the French king will push back the Russians out of France, part of Belgium, part of Germany, will uh, deliver part of Switzerland, will enter northern Italy, will liberate Rome. In the, mean, in the meantime, when all this takes place, the, the plague will spread throughout the world at a ghastly rate. Then Rome will be restituted. The three days of darkness will then take place. It will be the seal of the last prophecies. And then there will be a renewal, a renaissance of the world, of the church, of Christian society. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between. And we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way. So make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.